All right, welcome to our webinar series on open science for the discoverability of African research. My name is Ibuka Izike, project manager at Africa Archive. Before we move on, let me tell you a little about Africa Archive. So Africa Archive is a community-led digital archive for African research communication. By enhancing the visibility of African research, we enable discoverability and collaboration opportunities for African scientists on the continent, as well as globally. So today we welcome our speaker, Amanda French. But before we listen to what she has for us today, here's a little introduction of Dr. Amanda French. So Dr. Amanda French is the Technical Community Manager for the Research Organization Registry, RAW, at Crossref, where she works to promote the adoption of RAW in order to make information about research organizations cleaner and easier to exchange between systems. Dr. French is a well-known project director and community manager in digital humanities and scholarly communication. During the first year of the pandemic, she served as community lead at the COVID tracking project at the Atlantic, working with more than 800 volunteers to collect and publish key COVID-19 data. Earlier, she managed the Resilient Networks for Inclusive Digital Humanities project at GW Libraries, directed the Digital Research Services Units at Virginia Tech Libraries and led the DART Camp on Conference Initiative at GMU's Roy Rosenweg Center for History and New Media. She was also part of the initial cohort of CLIR, that's clear, with doctoral fellows. So once again, thank you all for joining us today and thank you to our guests and now over to our speaker, Dr. Amanda French. Thank you so much, Abuka. Um, I've just noticed that I'm wearing the same jacket today as I am in the photo. So <laughs> that's entirely accidental. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen and get started. Oops. Hang on. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. I'll get right to it. Um, I will warn you to begin with that um, although this title, this talk is subtitled Spotlight on Africa, uh, I would love to hear from you about any uses of PIDs or repository systems uh, that you may know of that are using ROAR because while we have some knowledge of uses of ROAR in Africa, we could always stand uh, to know more, um, uh, and uh, as I'll, I'll talk about why we don't know as much as we would like to uh, later on in the presentation. Um, so here's what I'm going to go over. Uh, just briefly, what are persistent identifiers? I think probably most people on this call likely know that, but it's always good to just have a little refresher. I'll go uh, into detail about what ROAR is and what ROAR offers. And then I'll talk a little bit about examples of ROAR integrations, not even so much exactly African ROAR integrations as systems that, as far as I know, are widely used in Africa that do have ROAR integrated. I saw we have Nina Sheke with me, um, and so we'll talk a little bit about Science Open. And then just a little bit about the future of research with ROAR. So what are persistent identifiers? This is a, uh, there's actually a very good uh, definition of persistent identifiers on Wikipedia. And as I said, I'm sure you all know, but one reason that I like to show this particular definition of persistent identifiers is not just because it's something that um, a very important um, PID entity in the United States has endorsed, but it also makes some, some really crucial points. Um, Obviously, most people know just from the name persistent identifiers that, uh, you know, a PID is an identifier. And obviously, most people do know that it's persistent. Uh, but one thing that uh, may not be quite as clear is that, uh, you know, persistent identifiers are globally unique. 
meaning that you could be using an identifier within your system that is persistent and does last. But if that identifier is not recognized by other systems around the world, it's not really what we think of as a persistent identifier. Uh, so globally unique, uh, persistent, of course, it needs to always resolve, always uh, uh, be around. That's one of the, the key features of them, unlike, say, a URL, which could easily break. Uh, machine resolvable, very important. PIDs are really a part of technical infrastructure. And then the, the final thing that I want to talk about from this slide is the fact that um, persistent identifiers, according to this definition and according to the definition of really, uh, you know, all the persistent identifier providers that I work with daily, PIDs in our definition have an associated metadata schema. So it's not just about the DOI or the ORCID or the ROAR ID, it's about all the metadata that is attached to that identifier. And I think that's a really important thing to remember. So here are some persistent identifiers that you're almost certainly uh, familiar with. Uh, a DOI uh, is one common persistent identifier used for research outputs. There are others such as handles, uh, which are in common use. Um, and DOIs are particularly good at providing that associated metadata schema that I, that I talked about. So it's not just that identifier, but it's a, it's a lot, a lot of information that is attached to that identifier that can be transferred between systems. Uh, most people are familiar with ORCID, uh, an identifier for researchers, and ROAR, um, which is somewhat newer than, than both of these identifiers, is an identifier for research organizations. Um, I won't show you this video. It's about three minutes long, um, which isn't too long. Uh, but even just, uh, you know, I wanted to include it in the slide deck so that you can watch it later if you like, if you are interested in showing um, what, uh, learning more about uh, PIDs and the value. But even just this thumbnail uh, from this video, I think is quite useful because it does show that network of connections that's enabled by persistent identifiers. And that, again, is really key. Uh, Persistent identifiers by themselves are not useful um, until they're linked to other persistent identifiers. I shouldn't say that they're not useful at all because they actually are quite useful <laughs> just in and of themselves, but they're most useful when they're widely, widely adopted and when they're connected to other systems and other identifiers. Oops, here, and again, I won't play that video, but you can watch it later if you like. So now let's go to ROAR. What is ROAR and what does it offer? This is our simple definition of what ROAR is. We are a global community-led registry of open persistent identifiers for research organizations. So what that looks like is um, what we can see here on this record. Um, we have the identifier itself in the upper left that is a randomly generated string, well, mostly randomly according to a particular pattern. And then that persistent identifier is attached to uh, important pieces of metadata about this organization, which happens to be Stellenbosch University. I met Joe Haveman at Stellenbosch University uh, last summer when we were there for open repositories. And uh, so I like to use it as an African institution, but we have um, hundreds, I think perhaps even thousands of uh, African organizations in ROAR. So you can see here that uh, the elements of a ROAR record include what kind of organization it is, other names it goes by, its location, and that's geolocated, which is uh, hugely useful if you're trying to do anything with maps, uh, the website for that organization, and then very importantly, related organizations. So uh, many organizations are complex. They have a lot of child organizations. They have laterally related organizations. Uh, and then we do also within the RAW record itself map the RAW ID to other existing organizational identifiers. And you can see the four most common ones there. Grid is uh, actually a, a formerly used organization identifier that provided the seed data for ROAR. So that is not a link because grid IDs are no longer publicly resolvable. Um, so anything that, uh, that was a grid should have a one-to-one -one map with a ROAR ID. Uh, but there are other identifiers, including ISNI, uh, Wikidata, and the Crossref Funder Registry. So, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, more later. So here's that exact same record, but shown in JSON data. So you can see again here, there's the ID, there's the name, um, there's the organization type, uh, there's the location. Um, 
and you know other names including aliases acronyms the wikipedia link uh, which isn't shown on the uh, the web-based record but is there um, country names and external identifiers and this really um, is one of the primary ways in which roar is used roar is really a part of technical infrastructure so many people are using uh, this data uh, this json data to incorporate uh, this information into their software systems so these are some of the problems that Roar solves. I think anybody who has worked with, for instance, a repository system or a publishing system is, is pretty much aware of this. When you have free text information, people just being human are going to enter that in a lot of different ways. And that makes all kinds of things problematic. You know, when you have multiple versions of an organization name, it makes it very hard to link things to that organization name. So specifically, um, the two most common problems we hear about are that research institutions, such as universities, have a very difficult time tracking the output that their researchers have published. And then we also hear that funders have a hard time tracking research outputs that they have funded, and Roar can solve both of those problems. Here's a very typical workflow uh, that, that shows how uh, Roar can help with this. So if you build Roar's data into a form, uh, say, for instance, a manuscript submission system, that user can, um, instead of typing in free text, they can select an organization name from essentially a pop-up list that is powered by Roar. And just behind that, that user will never see the Roar ID at all. Um, they don't need to uh, register for a Roar ID themselves, but that system, if it's integrated with Roar, will help them um, choose an organization and then have that information be consistent uh, as that information travels uh, within that system and to other systems. So then uh, when that Roar ID and its associated metadata is stored in metadata, that metadata can be shared with other systems and because it's linked to the Roar ID, all of that information attached to the Roar ID will also be consistent. Um, this is a very sort of crude diagram of interoperability. Um, you know, if you can imagine just an information name, uh, even an information, you know, an institution location, um, any kind of uh, metadata attached to that Roar ID, as long as you, as systems are sending that single Roar ID uh, between themselves, all of that metadata will travel with it with no loss. So this is the, the huge point of Roar. Roar makes information about research organizations clean, normalized, and easy to exchange among software systems. And as we all know, scholarly communication is composed of many, many systems. Um, there are publishing systems, there are repository systems, there are data repositories, there are funding systems, there are um, you know, large indexes, there are discovery systems. Um, you know, any single piece of research is probably, you know, indexed and or referenced in dozens of systems. And so it's very important to make sure that that metadata can be exchanged between all of those systems in a clean, normalized way. So here's just a really visual uh, example of that, uh, again, using Stellenbosch University. So here is a discovery system, um, which shall remain nameless, in which you can search for all the research where the, universe, the researcher's affiliation is Stellenbosch University. And you get very different results depending on what language you search in. Um, this is, you know, I think a, a really key thing. I mean, even when you're working within the same language, you know, what if somebody misspells Stellenbosch University, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, usually a lot of systems can manage that, but, uh, uh, you know, what's better for Roar is that, um, we can store alternate language versions of that university's name and associate them all with one another so that you don't have to, you know, do multiple searches in different languages to find all of the content that's associated with that institution. So here is just a demonstration that we've built um, showing the exact same thing. Um, when you search for Stellenbosch University, it's going to bring up the Roar ID. Of course, most systems are not going to show this, but uh, just for demonstration purposes, we're showing you that you can look. And in this case, um, uh, you know, different versions of the name of Stellenbosch University. And I think it's in um, 
uh, at any rate, you can you can retrieve the same exact uh, raw record no matter which language you type in. Here is a, one of the very first systems to adopt, or in fact, I think it was the first system uh, to adopt Roar was a data repository called Dryad, which you may be familiar with. You can, anyone can upload any data set there. Um, and they adopted Roar very early on. And this enables you to browse you know, all of the data sets where the researcher is associated with that institution. And so this is, again, it's quite useful just within this system. So Dryad actually has, uh, you know, you can browse by institution, uh, and that is enabled by Roar. But what it also enables is this sending of data. So if you're not familiar with data site commons, and again, we're talking about data sets here, but this is true for things like publications as well. Um, data site commons is a, a really, really helpful site that really shows what can be done with persistent identifiers. Um, it's built on Roar. Um, for organizations, you can probably see at the top there that the Roar ID is there. It's actually even in the URL. If you go to Data Site Commons and um, search for an organization, you'll see the Roar ID appear in the URL because its entire institutional model is built around Roar. And what this enables you to do is when you go to Data Site Commons and search by organization, you can then find all of the data sets that are associated with Stellenbosch University, and many of them come from Dryad. So the example on this page, for instance, comes from Dryad. So even if, though you can't see the Roar ID on Dryad, um, it's in the metadata that is then sent to its DOI registrar, which in this case is Datasite. And then Datasite has built a system where that metadata can be used to track the data sets associated with research done at, by researchers at Stellenbosch University. So that's the very uh, typical sort of use case for Roar. Um, I'll move now to telling you just a little bit about Roar's history. Um, Roar was developed over three years of workshops and working groups uh, long before I joined the project. Uh, there were many organizations involved in designing Roar, deciding what it should be, outlining its requirements and so on. And then after those uh, three years of discussion and a more official steering group and implementation group uh, was formed in order to set up something that would actually work technically. And as I mentioned, um, that involved uh, seed data from an existing organizational identifier called GRID, which was managed by a for-profit company called Digital Science, which had been providing this as a, as a community service, but I think really was beginning to recognize that this needed to be, um, this was so important to scholarly communication infrastructure that it needed to be something that was openly managed and uh, open data and um, sort of done by a group of people who were willing to sustain it into the future. So in 2019, um, Roar's minimum viable registry initial version was launched. We are in fact having our fifth anniversary of Roar at the end of January. So if you go to roar.org slash events, you can sign up for some of our fifth anniversary celebrations. Um, but then um, for, a, for a couple of years, nearly three years, um, we had, uh, Roar was um, synced with GRID. Um, and sorry about the dog barking if you can hear that. But uh, then GRID announced its plans to sunset and it did in fact sunset and then pass the torch as it were to Roar. So ever since March 22, we've been uh, independently curated from GRID, and GRID IDs, as I mentioned, no longer resolve. Um, we try to, as I mentioned, we are proud of being community-led, and one of the aspects of this is that we have uh, quite international community groups. Um, you may see that Joy Owango from TCC Africa is part of our steering group, and we do also have quite an international curation advisory board. Um, one moment, let me just see if I can manage the dog. <laughs> All right, okay, I think she's okay. Um, so yes, we, we do pride ourselves on having an international group of community advisors, and we're always um, you know, happy to hear from people who would like to be involved further. Um, one really, really key thing about Roar, I'm gonna talk about um, all of Roar's tools and services. We really pride ourselves and are very committed to being non-commercial and sustainable. Um, we, Roar itself is not an organization. 
We are operated as a collaborative initiative by the California Digital Library, Crossref, and Data Site as part of each organization's ongoing operational budget. So kind of what I like to say is that, you know, the you know, for organizations who are members of Crossref, who who are members of Data Site, part of what they get for those fees is this system that benefits everybody. Um, so that's how all of Roar's tools and services can be free. Is that um, we while we do get some uh, grants from uh, from organizations. Um, most recently, we've been benefiting from. Um, open infrastructure funding uh, managed by SCOS. But um, this is how we can remain free. There's, there's no trick here. We, we offer everything for free because this is an important part of scholarly communication infrastructure. So here's just a few features of ROAR. We have over 105,000 records. Um, we are really striving to uh, have global coverage of institutions. All of our data is in the public domain, there's no need to deal with licenses of any kind for using raw data. It's as it's entirely free, no, no need for attribution or any kind of registration. Um, our REST API, which delivers that JSON data, is entirely free to use. We try to keep raw really easy to integrate. Um, we're, we concentrate a lot on multilingual metadata and character sets. Uh, we maintain organizational hierarchies. We have a really nice, pretty uh, searchable web interface. And we make it, we try to make it very uh, easy to request changes and additions. So in that web interface, um, if you look up your own organization, which I encourage you to do, um, just go to roar.org slash search and look for your own organization. If you see something that isn't in there or something that is wrong, um, there's a link right on that record to just request a change and that's entirely free. And we will do that usually within um, about four weeks uh, at the most. Um, we have a centrally curated uh, registry. So as you may be familiar with ORCID, ORCID IDs, ORCID profiles are managed by individual researchers. So a researcher needs to sign up for an ORCID ID and manage their profile. That's not true for ROAR. ROAR is centrally curated. So we have um, you know, staff members who manage uh, what information is in ROAR. And so we, just, uh, we review requests. Anyone can request a change and we review it. We compare it to publicly available data and uh, make determinations about whether or not um, to include that. And as I mentioned, we have a, a, a global curation advisory board that helps us set policies and make difficult decisions when needed. Here are some of the use cases for ROAR. As I mentioned, like the sort of key thing that ROAR is used for is linking research to institutions. Um, so collecting researcher institutional affiliations is one of the major use cases. And standardizing those names, but we see war used a lot too um, for institutions to be able to just do all, all kinds of reporting and tracking and statistics analysis um, once they are collecting that and roar makes that possible. Funders in particular are um, be, some funders uh, need funders need to connect um, the grants that they've given to published research that has come out of this and war is increasingly being used for that function. Roar is also really good for discoverability, um, you know, especially, but not only in that case of where you want to find, you know, all the research that was produced at a particular place. We've seen some publishers beginning to use Roar to manage their institutional open access deals. So, for instance, if an institution has made a deal with a publisher to pay an APC charge for researchers from that institution, um, the publisher can use Roar to say, okay, this, inst this researcher is associated with this, this institution, therefore they qualify for this deal. Um, national services are increasingly using Roar um, to sort of track compliance with their policies. And just in general, Roar is meant to improve affiliation metadata in the global research ecosystem. Um, and then here is, uh, you know, there, here's why that's important. Um, again, like because we are free and because we are open, that means that all of this metadata is can be used by any system. Uh, it can be used by organizations of any budget, not just by large for-profit 
organizations that have the budget to pay. Um, that's not the case for Roar. Anyone can use Roar. It's as easy as we can make it. Um, we even have a service in our REST API for matching text strings to Roar IDs. So um, we try to uh, provide really good documentation so that that's easy to implement. Um, and we also have tools if you want to do more manual um, cleanup. You have a bunch of text strings for organizations in a database or in a spreadsheet or something like that. We are providing free tools that will help you clean that up and match those to Roar identifiers. So again, established, trusted, no cost, widely adopted service, and we are becoming a global standard for this purpose. Okay, so let's uh, just talk a little bit. I do want to leave some time for questions about some examples of Roar integrations, um, especially for systems that I think are, are widely used um, in Africa. So these are some sort of key infrastructure systems. Um, Roar is, the, is, for the last two years, maybe close to three, has been the preferred organizational identifier in ORCID. So for those of you who have an ORCID profile, if you are uh, listing where you're currently employed or where you were educated and so on, um, if you go in and edit that, or just, you, know, you will be asked to choose from a list and that list is almost certainly powered by ROAR. Although um, ORCID does use other organizational identifiers, um, so it may or may not be ROAR, but most likely it is. Um, and so that's only going to increase. And again, that's not, you can actually see it in the ORCID interface, um, but you won't necessarily um, find it unless you're looking for it. Um, Crossref, one of the major DOI registrars, uh, also, cites Roar as its preferred organizational identifier. I, as I mentioned, Crossref is one of the, or, the operating organizations of Roar. I actually am employed full-time by Crossref um, to work only on Roar. Uh, but yes, uh, Crossref, you know, when uh, publishers are sending metadata to Crossref, uh, when they are creating DOIs, uh, we are encouraging them to use Roar IDs to identify those researcher affiliations. Datasite, as I showed you, Datasite actually adopted Roar quite a quite a while ago, right after Roar released its pilot in 2019. So, um, you know, the the it's not quite this simple, but of course, Crossref is usually used for creating DOIs for publications, whereas Datasite is usually used for creating DOIs for data sets, um, or sometimes you know things like theses and gray literature and institutional repositories. So there there are a lot more Roar IDs in Datasite than there are in Crossref. Um, if you are familiar with what it takes to run an institutional repository, you're probably familiar with Sherpa Romeo, which is a database of open access policies. Um, those systems have integrated Roar. Um, there's a system called the uh, a service, a, a company, or a, a nonprofit actually called uh, the Open Access Switchboard, which is helping um, do that open access deal management. Um, they are heavily reliant on Roar. Counter, which provides statistics uh, and metrics for journal usage relies on ROAR. Um, DOAJ has actually said they are going to adopt ROAR. Um, so that's I, I think that's not quite implemented yet. Um, there are two very large um, indexes of scholarship that I think if you haven't explored, um, you it would be worth it. A lot of people use Google Scholar. I do also use Google Scholar. Google Scholar is not using ROAR, um, and we, they may or may not do so in the future. But um, similar sort of large scale indexes of scholarly works include Open Alex, which is quite new, uh, and the Lens, uh, which is at lens.org. Um, so here's just an example of uh, what Roar is enabling in Open Alex. So Open Alex indexes about 249 million uh, works of research, mostly publications, uh, not. Um, supplementary materials like data sets. But here again, using the example of Stellenbosch University, you can see that you know if you go to OpenAlex and choose this institutional filter, which is entirely powered by Roar on the back end, you can see not only what works are associated with Stellenbosch University, but their citation counts. Uh, what year were they published? It's a really nice sort of simple interface. And OpenAlex itself also has an application programming interface so that it can be incorporated into systems. Um, there are many, many repository and CRIS systems that use Roar. I've shown you Dryad. The, some of you may be familiar with Zenodo, which is a generalist repository. 
they uh, migrated their systems uh, back in October, and they moved to a system called Invenio, which is a, quite a new system, um, and it has Roar built in throughout it. So similarly, anything new that's added to Zenodo, where there's a researcher affiliation or even a funding affiliation, that's going to use Roar IDs uh, to identify that institution, and you'll even see the Roar logo on there. So that same system that Zenodo is using now is available for others to use. It's called Invenio RDM, and there are other repositories using it. Uh, Mendeley Data is a generalist repository system that has recently integrated Roar, again, just in the last few months. Um, Open Science Framework at the Center for Open Science uh, integrated Roar. I think last year, um, a system called Vivly and DSpace Chris is, uh, we're actually just about to announce um, Roar in DSpace Chris. It's, it's built in, I, I think the, the actual uh, official announcement has not been made yet, but the newest version of DSpace Chris does have Roar in it and Roar is going to be proposed for DSpace version eight. Um, here is an example of what Roar looks like in that system I mentioned, uh, Invenio RDM, which is now powering Zenodo. You can see here that the creator of this particular piece, uh, I've sort of zoomed in here, is uh, marked by an orchid. And the uh, in this case, there's actually uh, an institution that is itself a creator because Northwestern University has said it will manage the data for this. Um, for this data set. And that has the nice Roar logo on it because it's got Roar in the back end. There are a number of publishing systems using Roar. Publishers have been a bit slower to adopt Roar, but they are doing it. Almost everyone that I talk to says they're in the process of doing it. I think they just, um, it's not a huge priority for them. And, um, you know, some of them are already using other institutional identifiers. Uh, we have Nina Sheke here with Science Open, which of course is one of the hosts for Africa Archive. And we saw a very nice presentation um, by Nina uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago at our Roar community call. Um, so I've got a couple, of, I've, I've snitched a couple of her screenshots from there to show you. Um, Open journal systems, I understand, is quite widely used in Africa, and we do have, um, there is limited Roar integration to that now, and again, there are plans for even more Roar integration into OJS in the coming years. Um, other publishing systems, especially uh, Scholastica, which is quite large, either are currently using Roar or are planning to use Roar, and we do have more publishers uh, beginning to integrate Roar all the time. Um, here are uh, some of Nina's slides about uh, their use of, of Roar, which they integrated back in February. Uh, and she's uh, shown here, you know, what the Roar ID looks like in that metadata uh, behind the interface. It enables an easy lookup for institutions uh, within the interface for Science Open. And I put the link to that community call that we just had from a couple of weeks ago, if you'd like to see more about that. Uh, and then similarly here, uh, Nina has shown what the Roar IDs actually look like, and in this case, um, the list of affiliations for uh, a particular article. Um, so both, uh, some of you may or may not be familiar with a, a system called Open Preprint Systems. Most people are familiar with OJS, Open Journal Systems. Open Preprint Systems is, is very similar. I mean, it's exactly this, it's also, you know, um, created by PKP and works quite similarly. Um, I have a screenshot here on the left from uh, Cielo Preprints, uh, which is 25 years old, is very, very uh, widely used in Latin America. And you can see the Roar IDs there, and that is powered by OPS, Open Preprint Systems, which is very similar to OJS. And what this is doing is really only um, making the, the affiliation metadata consistent within the system. Uh, What's coming in both OJS and OPS um, at the end, really, probably of 2024, is better Roar integration. So the Roar integration that you see on the left is managed by a plugin, uh, and that is available for if you do use OJS. But the, the newest version of OJS and OPS will integrate Roar into the core code base. So again, it won't be, you don't need to install a plugin, you don't need to think about it, um, it will just be there so that when authors who use, for instance, open journal systems are adding the institution they're affiliated with, they'll just get to pick from a Roar powered list. And then that metadata will be uh, sendable to places like Crossref in DOI registration metadata. 
Um, so there are some funding systems that use Roar, uh, and this is particularly important. We're seeing more and more use of this. Um, and again, this is helping to enable uh, tracking of research uh, by institution. This is a screenshot from a, a funding system called Proposal Central. I understand that Africa has about, um, I think it's 16 government research councils that uh, do a lot of the funding in Africa. Uh, and so we've been doing a little bit of talking with uh, people in Africa about, you know, how those funding institutions can use ROAR. Often one of the first steps is just to make sure that your organization is properly represented in ROAR. Uh, and then later on, um, we can integrate it into systems. There are a lot of reporting and analytic services that use, uh, services that use ROAR. Um, some of these are used um, mostly by publishers such as Chron Chronos Hub and Data Salon. Um, the Koki Open Access Dashboard is very interesting. It's, it's an Australian project that is uh, tracking internationally, um, essentially, metrics about open access in every country. Actually, I'm wishing now that I had done a screenshot from there because it's uh, very nice. You can go to any, any country and look up sort of open access metrics for that, and that is based on ROAR. Um, so you can always go look at that. But the screenshot that I have included, one of them that I have, is from a system called OA Report. And again, you may be able to see just right up here at the top that you can actually search by ROAR ID because similarly, um, just like Open Alex, just like many other systems, the institutional model for this system is based upon ROAR. So in this case, what you can do with OA Report is that you can look up how many articles that were funded by the United States National Institutes of Health are open access. How many of them have data availability systems? How many of them are free to read? So this is all based on the ROAR ID for the US National Institutes of Health. And this is all, this is a, a free system as well. There's, an, you know, this is, you can go to this on the web and look this up. It's a, a very nice system. So I'll just conclude um, so that we have enough time for any questions. Um, I wanted to show you again, some, just some statistics that I like to show people about the increase in use of ROAR. Um, Crossref began, uh, really built ROAR into its, its metadata schema in early 2022. So you can see here from this graph, here are the number of ROAR IDs that are in DOI metadata in Crossref. It's going up all the time. Um, the big spike back in August was from a single adopter. So we were always seeing that is that once one large um, system adopts ROAR, these numbers go up and up. But you can see they've been steadily trending up. And similarly, as I mentioned, because DataCite adopted ROAR so much earlier, back in 2019, which is actually not on this chart, um, you know, those have also been going up and up and up. There's over, uh, well over a million ROAR IDs in DataCite records. And then again, a quite recent spike from a single system that integrated ROAR IDs and began sending them to, cross, uh, to DataCite. So I, I always like to think of this as, you know, one, one organization can make a huge difference. And you can see that in these charts. Um, here again is, uh, I, I wanted to show you some statistics about ROAR compared to other identifiers in DataCite. So again, just because uh, DataCite's, DataCite has more ROAR IDs and because their API allows you to do this breakdown by organization identifier, I thought this might be interesting for you to see. So any you know, data set or, or entity that is registering DOIs with data site, um, if they have uh, an affiliation ID at all, you know, chances are 80% that that's a ROAR ID. There are some systems that are still using grid IDs, but that's sort of decreasing over time. And there are very few that use ISNI IDs for this purpose. <laughs> Similarly, um, ROAR can be used not only for researcher affiliations, but to identify a funding organization. Now, Crossref has been running, as you may know, um, the Open Funder Registry, the Crossref Funder Registry, for a little over 10 years. And we do map all ROAR IDs to the Funder Registry, and we've been doing a lot of work in that regard. The Funder Registry has been the default, the, the recommended uh, persistent identifier to identify funders, uh, but it was recently announced that the funder registry and ROAR are going to be merging and uh, we're going to be 
you know, Crossref and in fact, the whole ecosystem will be recommending that we use Roar IDs for that purpose instead of Crossref funder registries. Those DOIs will continue to resolve. They are persistent, uh, but we're going to, that, that yellow 65% um, um, use of funder IDs for funders is going to shrink and shrink and shrink, and it will become uh, Roar IDs. But I, I, I think it's quite interesting that, um, again, in data site, not in Crossref, um, there's already a significant percentage of people who are using Roar IDs to identify funders. When you have a research article and you you say who funded the, the work that resulted in this article, 28% um, of the time, that's a Roar ID, when there's an identifier at all. Um, so here is one of the things, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what's coming for Roar. Um, because we've only been independently curated for um, not quite two years, um, we've done a lot of work over the last year to sort of overhaul our metadata schema to make it simpler and to include things that people need. Um, so I don't need to go into the details of this, but suffice it to say, we did a lot of work with our community working this out. And so there will be a second version of the Roar metadata schema and API launching in the first quarter of next year. We will continue to maintain the current version. Um, so there's nothing to worry about there. Uh, we'll, we'll maintain that version for at least a year after we release 2.0, but this is something that we've been working on and will continue to work on. And then, as I mentioned, some of the one of the things that we've been working on over the course of last year and will continue to be working on in the coming years is this merging of the funder registry and Roar. Um, so the funder registry, as I said, is about 10 years old. It's got roughly, I think, 34,000 records in it, and those records are only funders. Roar has over 105,000 um, entities in it, and many of those are funders. <laughs> so there was sort of, sort of no reason to have both these registries, given that Roar can serve this function. So we're working very closely with Crossref, where, as I say, I work <laughs> in order to do this work and, and helping people who have been using the funder registry IDs transition to Roar. Um, I wanted to mention specifically, this was something that um, that we got out of open repositories in South Africa at Stellenbosch University. One of the things that we heard from people there is that it would be nice to solve, it would be nice to be able to track things that come from Africa. Um, Roar, it's more makes it very easy to track things by country, um, but we don't actually at the moment have a sort of a, a regional filter. So we can't, for instance, search by uh, search by continent. We can't search by, you know, anything that comes from Africa. Um, so we have requested that, that it's on our roadmap, and we may be um, including that. I haven't shown it as a screenshot, but that is actually something that you can do with Open Alex. If you are looking for, hey, I'd like to see all of the research produced in Africa for the last year or something like that, um, Open Alex does have those regional filters, and so you can go there and play around with that and, and do that, because they've added that on top of to what they've done with Roar. You know, it's quite easy, of course, just to say, well, these are the countries in Africa, you know, just add all those up, and then, um, then you get a total for Africa that's country by country, but of course, that's a little bit of a hassle. So that's something that we're doing. Um, and really, this is my last slide. Um, if you're more, if you're interested in, in getting involved with this, if you'd like to uh, learn more about Roar, join the Roar community, um, this is what you can do. We have a technical documentation site. If you happen to be a developer or know a developer that um, where you can integrate Roar into your systems. Um, if you have, uh, if you work at a library and you have vendors, if you work at a publisher and you have control over systems, um, you can ask uh, your colleagues and software vendors and developers to adopt Roar. Um, just put in a request to whatever system they have for requesting features and ask them to adopt Roar if they're not already using it. We have um, a number of informational materials, sort of one-page brochures and that kind of a thing, um, stored on Zenodo at that link uh, in the Roar community. You can always come to Roar events, and you can get further involved with the Roar community in many ways. Just get updates from us, uh, join our newsletter, uh, give us feedback when we are um, doing changes, all of that kind of thing. We'd love for you to be involved. And that's all. Happy to take questions. All right. Um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Amanda French, for taking us through what Roar is doing to help promote um, research work in Africa and the rest of the world. All right. We have a couple of questions here in the chat. So I'll start with the first one. 
Yes. All right, it says, with all the benefits Rob brings to the community and the fact that it is all freely available under CC0, is there any possible misuse that, that may arise? And should, and one what? that we should be aware of? Yeah. That is such a good question. Um, I cannot think of any possible misuses, but I will say that the, um, it, you know, because to me, this is like, uh, you know, it shows how old I am, but it's like a telephone directory. Um, you know, you, you, it like, it's all very public information. Like there's nothing in a rural record that isn't already on that institution's website. You know, I mean, it's just, what is the name of the organization? Where is it? What is its website? It's all quite innocuous information there's no privacy thing and we don't we don't store any there's nothing that we store privately we don't have anybody's email addresses we don't have any of that thing the one thing that i will say that has come up and it's not so much about what is in roar occasionally people will ask us about sanctioned organizations so in countries that are you know undergoing sanctions from one or another country is there any way to mark that in roar and there isn't uh, any way to say this organization is sanctioned, therefore do not, you know, interact with them in any way. Um, we have looked at just specifically in the US, what are the organizations that are sanctioned that we're not supposed to do any business with, and those are not in ROAR? <laughs> like, they're, like so far, organizations, no organiza organizations in ROAR are all uh, wonderful and they're not, um, they're not sanctioned. So that's the only thing I can think of. Um, yeah. I hope that answers your question, but we can. Uh... Okay. Um, thank you very much. I hope that question is clear. <laughs> if it is not, there will be a follow up question to that. All right. The next question we have here is uh, How do we get an API for a database and platform we are building that can benefit from all the database? Um, so if. Um... <sighs> If you're asking how to set up an API for your own systems, I think that's probably beyond my expertise. Um, if you're asking how to use Roar's API, um, let me give you a link to the uh, to the documentation. The other thing, actually, I will say, which is not in the presentation at all, I should actually probably put this back in here, is that in order to you don't have to use Roar's API in order to use the data. We do have a fully downloadable data set. Um, so let me just give you a link to the that documentation. One sec. Um, it is the the general link is in the the, the last slide, but um, uh, if you would like to use Roar's API, um, there's instructions on how to do that here. But we do also have an entirely uh, downloadable data set. Um, and you have just that information in JSON and in CSV right here. So if you prefer to just download the raw data and store that locally and look that up, that's something that you can do without using Roar's API. If you like, just, just get it, download it, open it as a CSV. Um, you can certainly do that. Does that hey. help? Yep. Thank you very much. Um, so I think the question was asked by um, Kirimi Cindy. So if there's a follow-up question, you can always um, put that in the chat. Yep. But if not, please give me follow the links that have been provided in the chat. Yep. So there's another question again here. It says, what if an institution that has raw ID also is a funder? Right. Should they have one or more raw IDs? Um, so no, um, every institution will have one raw record and then um, they can have multiple types. Now, one, um, so uh, most of the records that are in Roar now do not have multiple types. Uh, and that's just because we inherited all that data from a previous, um, that previous project grid. And for whatever reason, they gave everything one institution type. But so for instance, and the other thing is, I actually think we need to work a bit on our types of institutions. But for instance, like two of our, our institution types are, we actually don't even have a funder type yet, but that is coming in version two next year. Um, so as part of what we're doing with that version two work, we're adding a type called funder to our list of types. But we also have, for instance, government. So many, many organizations are part of government and also a funder. 
Um, many institutions are a nonprofit, which is one of our types, and also a funder. So no, you would have one record with uh, multiple types, but that is something that we're working on. Um, so first of all, we have to add the funder type, and then we have to curate a lot of that data so that they do have multiple types. But anything right now, the way the funder part is going to be quite easy because the way we're going to do that is that anything that currently has a Crossref funder ID as an external ID is going to get the type funder. Um, so that part will be quite easy. And then it's just going to be additional curation saying, well, this, you know, it, I think it's like working out what makes most sense in the organization types. Okay. Thank you very much for making Hi. that clear. Um, there is another question here by Mark Garlinghouse. And then it goes thus. It says, how does raw handle changes in organization names and mm -hmm. structures over time? For example, if an organization changes its name or merges or demerges at a particular point in time. Yep. Um, I actually think for these, I'm going to um, share my screen again, and I'll, I'll show you both the question about, um, about types and about uh, over time, um, if you don't mind. Let's see here. So um, hopefully you can see my screen again. Um, I will go to roar.org. Um, we have a search page where you can see uh, records. Um, and then, uh, you know, so someone asked what I meant by multiple types. Here is uh, an organization record, and here is the organization type. You can see here that this organization has only one type which is that is, this is an educational institution, but this can have multiple types. So for instance, you could have, um, you know, this could be both um, a healthcare institution and an educational institution. And so we would just list multiple types here. Um, similarly, um, when we're dealing with names over time, um, this, it, it really very much depends on what has actually happened to that institution. If an institution just changes its name and in all other respects is the same, we put that previous name into this field. Um, it's, it's actually, it's a field called aliases. It just means other names that for this institution. Um, and we are talking about sort of maybe breaking that out so that it's specifically a previous name and not just another name. But the other thing that we have done is sometimes organizations, they don't just change their name, they are completely different or they're acquired by another organization or something like that. So one of the first things that we did even before um, working on all of that, um, all of the metadata change I was talking about um, was, uh, working on um, previous uh, you know, predecessor organizations and successor organizations. So we have, it's not, I think it's not shown in the, um, the web interface exactly, um, but organization status is the thing that we worked on quite a lot. So for instance, if an organization just goes out of business, <laughs> ceases producing research, we would mark that record inactive. But if it's then um, succeeded by another organization, we put that within the record. So, you know, here's an organization, it got acquired by something else, changed its name, and it has a successor organization. We mark that in the type. Um, so again, that gets quite involved, but it, it really kind of depends on what exactly has happened with that organization. If it's just changed its name, it keeps the same or identifier and we put the previous name in the aliases field. Um, if it's undergone significant other changes, that probably would lead to this rural record is now succeeded by this other organization. Uh, but in, in those cases, it's always, um, it's quite clearly marked. Here's a record this record is no longer active, it's succeeded by this other record. The records themselves are never deleted, they are persistent, um, they will stay around, but we will indicate whether this is an active or inactive organization, and if it's got a successor organization. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, um, Amanda, for those wonderful responses. Um, do we have any other question? If you do have any other question, you can type that in the chat. But meanwhile, before we get any other question, I think I have a final one. Mm -hmm. So um, 
Please, Amanda, can you tell us, has there been any challenge or maybe can you share any success stories um, that RAW has experienced even in trying to promote research work um, in the world, especially in Africa? Are there success stories, are there challenges? Um, it's interesting because um, we consider every integration of ROAR into a system to be a success. Um, we consider every um, lack of use of ROAR in a system to be a challenge and a failure. Um, what I have, and again, I, I would really be, I would love to hear what systems you are using in ROAR for this, for, in Africa for these types of things. I, I have heard anecdotally a couple of things. Um, one is that for a number of universities, university libraries uh, in Africa, much of the time their institutional repository uses DSpace, which does not have ROAR in it. Um, that has been a sort of a, a, a major challenge for us. As I mentioned, we are, uh, and it's, it's a lot to do with, you know, how DSpace is constructed and the fact that it's um, open source and all that. Roar is going to be a proposed feature of DSpace 8. And then I think the challenge will be that many of those institutional repositories in Africa won't upgrade to DSpace 8. I have, I've managed a DSpace repository. It's very difficult to upgrade. I'm not going to, you know, um, lie about that. Can I, just, I think, an, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Can I just pause you there because that's exactly where Africa Archive comes in because Africa Archive, yeah. as many of you might have seen, is now hosted and, and managed by Ubuntu, also the Ubuntu Net Alliance and also managed by. And um, access to perspectives, we will continue working with Africa Archive supporting Ubuntu Net in the mm -hmm. endeavor of making sure that that's happening properly and that we support African institutions, librarians, and NREN um, tech staff in getting this accomplished and also for, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. To, to leverage on all the possibilities that we now have. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I, I suppose the other thing that we're, we're always finding a bit of a challenge is that, um, you know, one, one analogy that I've used is that, you know, we manufacture vacuum cleaners, but we, we can't clean your house for you, <laughs> you know, like we're relying on other people to, we can tell you how to use the vacuum cleaner, we can, you know, write a nice manual about it, but we don't actually do that work of, for instance, helping you track your institutional research outputs. We're reliant on other systems to do that. So, you know, you can't vacuum your house if you don't have a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and if you don't have a vacuum cleaner that works well, you can't vacuum your house, you know? So, but that is, we, we are encouraging people all the time, please integrate Roar into your systems so that people can track their research. But it's, it's that first step that we're kind of responsible for more than the second step of actually helping people to track their research. That being said, I, I, I really will, you know, there are many systems that, that can help with that tracking of research, um, which, which again, I say tracking research, but it really is about visibility of research too, right? It's not just about like metrics. It's about, um, you know, systems creating discovery tools that can help um, raise the profile of, of research from Africa. But, um, but the systems that I think are, are most exciting are in that regard is really open Alex, uh, and lens. So, um, these are in my presentation, but, um, if you do want to go explore there uh, and explore there, both of these systems use roar, um, whether or not you can see it, sometimes you can see it. And they're massive indexes of research that are more or less global in scale. And I suspect that African research is probably not as well represented in those systems <laughs> as it is, uh, you know, as European research and Western research is. That's sort of always the case. Uh, but getting Aurora, ID, you know, making sure that your Aurora IDs um, for your institutions are you know, making sure that your institutions are well represented in Roar, that is something we are happy to work with you on. We would love for you to tell us, hey, this may, you know, these institutions are not in Roar or their information is not correct because when there are um, 
Roar IDs traveling through these systems, it's going to improve the representation in major indexes like this. Uh, and that being said, uh, you may want to look around in both Open Alex and Lens and see, can I find research that's associated with my institution? What does that look like? How is the coverage? Um, so, because um, I think that those are going to be useful tools for almost everybody. And um, both of them are, are at least partly free. Um, mostly free for yeah. uh, a lot of basic services. We had the lens in our webinar just last time. Oh, yeah. So the recording is up for everyone to check in. Great. Um, and we will likely also have Open Alex on the show next year. Yeah. So the yeah. whole the lower point with the series is to present each service on their own, but also how they integrate with each other. And you did an, a stellar job in, in referencing other systems and services. Wonderful. Great resource. Yeah, I saw that you had a science open um, presentation quite recently. So yeah, that's sure. Ivan, yeah. Yep. Oh. Uh, okay, just had a question come in again. Do you want to read it out, Ibuka? Or also, Kirimi, if you want to speak, feel free to. Okay. okay let me just read it out. It says, um, we're building a database for Africa and looking at African products and literature from African researchers and institutions. And this is very important. So I think she's mm -hmm. just um, making a final statement, not like it's a actual mm -hmm. question. Yeah, and on that note also, um, let's work together with Africa Archive Ubuntu Net Alliance because we're on the same boat for the region and in touch with um, Amanda and Nina and Mark was here earlier. Um, we can, yeah, make sure that this is most efficiently done and of most or best possible service to the community. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, um, Amanda, for mm -hmm. bringing to us this um, wonderful presentation. Um, we've learned a lot from all that you've guided us through. So I want to thank you for making yourself available for this webinar. And I also want to thank our guests for making themselves available for this webinar session. So I have sent in the chat the links where you can find um, the slide and the recording of this whole webinar session. So this webinar series is organized by Ubuntu Ness Alliance. The link is also there in the chat and access to perspectives as part of the ORCID Global Participation Program. So you're going to find all of the links in the chat. So we'll upload the slides um, in the link that is made available also in the chat and the recording as well. All right, so today's speaker has been Amanda French, Dr. Amanda French, and she has been speaking on the topic raw the identifier for research institutions and universities and the spotlight was on Africa. So thank you all for, for coming. Like I said, this webinar session um, so far has been interesting and we've learned a lot. So this will be our last webinar session for the year, but we have many other sessions that are coming up in the next year, 2024 with so much other exciting speakers as well. So our, webinars, our next webinar session will be on January 18th, 2024, with the African Reproducibility Network, Aaron, and Emmanuel Boakie will be our guest. So we look forward to having you attend our next webinar session. And, and in the absence of any other thing, let me just check through the chat. I don't think there is any other question. So in the absence of any other thing, this is where we will put the whole webinar session to an end. And we'll be looking forward to seeing you in our next webinar session. So thank you to our guest, Dr. Amanda French, for making our time to come and explain everything about the rock to us. And then also thank you to our audience for taking the time to make yourself available for this webinar session. So thank you all and have a wonderful holiday season. See you in our next webinar session next year. Bye.